I'm Anthony Leeds. It's my pleasure again to welcome you to my second conversation with Dr. Rana Markahi from uh, the Department of Medicine in Waterford in the Republic of Ireland. Um, she's also the director of the medical director of the hospital in Waterford and also the uh, sub undergraduate dean for the uh, College of Surgeons of Ireland. So welcome again, uh, Rihanna, and thank you very much for being prepared to talk to us. Last week we were talking about um, dementia and its characteristics and the factors that are associated with it. Uh, we talked a little bit about the studies that have been done in uh, Waterford, the Remind trial, um, and then we probably need now to talk a little bit more about usual management of um, dementia and where the Remind results might well fit in in the fullness of time, or perhaps they fit in already. Perhaps you could expand on that for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I suppose when we talk about dementia, I'm going to talk really mainly about Alzheimer's disease, which is the main cause of dementia. And what is Alzheimer's disease? So it's a, you know, a condition that gives you progressive changes in your short term memory, but also affects your ability to do your everyday activities or your daily day to day functions and can affect your behaviour and mood. So as somebody who suffers with dementia, the, the impact on their lives is just really considerable, you know, so they can have difficulty with memory, they can have difficulty recognising people, so recognising loved ones, they can have difficulty getting dressed, doing all of their normal as the disease progresses. And, you know, as, as a, a very heartbreaking comment is, is that they can have difficulty remembering yesterday. So, you know, this is a condition that we really need to intervene in. So you talk about what are we doing at the moment? I suppose what we're doing at the moment is we're trying to um, identify Alzheimer's disease earlier, but it would be fair to say that the main emphasis on the treatment of, of Alzheimer's disease to date has been on pharmacological intervention or drugs. And really there was, you know, two families of drugs, cholinesterase inhibitors and NNDA receptor antagonists, both of which have been on the market now for, well, 11 years and 18 or 19 years respectively and more laterally there are new group, groups of drugs that are thought to improve cognition and improve quality of life but are are extraordinarily expensive and you know quite difficult to administer in it that it's, it's in infusions but fantastic the drugs are improving really where where i'm coming from with the management of alzheimer's diseases it's much more a global condition than that so I would like, you know, that we really address the other modifiable things that we can, modifiable risks that we can do, such as um, smoking cessation, cutting back your alcohol, your lifestyle, your ability to get into a routine or habit, and diet. Diet is just so important. So when we're when we're looking at that sort of global health approach, um, we we put a lot of emphasis on diet and exercise. Yeah. Um. So from a practical point of view, um, we, uh, in the previous talk, we were talking about young people and how difficult it might well be to get them to to make changes. But if we think of people in, in middle midlife who may well be getting closer to the point where they might anticipate problems and who may well have been detected to have raised blood pressure and uh, possibly even diabetes, um, more aggressive detection and um, intervention in conditions that we are routinely managing in medical practice would, would in any case be important, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And, you know, the uh, the what's the best present you can give yourself for your 50th birthday party, they say, is, is go to your GP and get your blood pressure checked and get your <laughs> lipid profile checked and all of these things. And it's just, you know, it, it's something that we tend to and dismiss, I'm feeling well, therefore I'm not going to get myself checked out or, you know, I'm putting on a few pounds, but that's OK at this age. But you know, maybe if we can get the message out there that actually um, controlling your blood pressure and, you know, controlling some things that we know are risk factors. And I know I mentioned that in our last time speaking um, together, but things like, you know, watching your weight, keeping your exercise up, watching your lipids and cholesterol and watching your diet. So these are all really important things that we should all be doing and not waiting for, you know, not waiting for the problem to arise. And there are one or two other interesting um, points that are uh, described in the uh, guidelines and various documents about helping people to slow the progression if, if there is already a beginning of dementia. So, for example, hearing loss. 
and hearing loss can result in social isolation and it's known that being more socially interactive can be beneficial and uh, and many of the programs and I know that in the Republic of Ireland you've got a very good well from what I've read a very good system of trying to identify people and trying to provide all the various levels of care that are needed right the way through the whole progress um, but getting good <coughs> making sure that there aren't people who are hiding away, going deaf and not being integrated into any kind of activity, then encouraging people to be socially active rather than being in isolation, um, being physically active and being out there. And the issue also that's related to it, of course, is frailty as well. And people can get to a point where they are physically frail if they are isolated, can't they? So encouraging people to do the right things, even extraordinary things like sitting in your chair and doing some exercises to maintain muscle strength, for example, these simple things that none of us ever have thought of doing in the past, but really we all ought to be, um, as we age, we perhaps ought to be doing them. What, any comments on any of those? Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, hearing is is now a modifiable, a very well recognised modifiable risk factor for dementia. And in fact, in people with mild cognitive impairment, so they haven't yet developed Alzheimer's disease, but their memory wouldn't be as good as age matched controls or people of a similar age. 85% of people with mild cognitive impairment have, um, you know, ha also have hearing impairment. And for people with mild hearing impairment, it doubles your risk of Alzheimer's disease. For people with moderate, it trebles your risk. And for people with severe hearing loss, you have a five-fold increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. And one of the most common things that I get here is that, of course, hearing aids can be, they can be a challenge in themselves. And uh, most hearing aids are kept on the locker by the bed or they're kept somewhere else, but not in your ear. And unfortunately, they don't work. And it's really emphasising, you know, again, all of these um, conversations need to be had both in a healthcare and a public care setting that your hearing is so important. And I was delighted to hear you talking about, about um, you know, trying to reduce frailty. So, you know, we, we often talk about, um, you know, if, you, if you're lying in bed for 10 days, you can lose up to 10 years of muscle mass. So getting out of bed, getting out of the chair, and people think that exercise means that you have to go into a gym and lift extraordinarily heavy weights, but no, and you can get out and go for a walk and do simple things like stand up and sit down and use your muscles, recruit your muscles and keep those muscles going because once you lose them, it's more of a challenge to get them back again. So, you know, simple exercise, um, hearing and social interaction, you know, really we found that there was a big increase in or, you know, you know Alzheimer's disease appeared to sort of rapidly progress in people during the COVID time because, of course, one, they weren't socialising to the same extent and they were anxious about COVID and its impact on them and their loved ones. And we really found that it had a detrimental effect because a lot of people, for example, you know, there was all of these embargoes on going out. There, a lot of people stopped driving. They stopped going to their playing bridge or going to their social clubs or whatever. And then after the couple of years, they found it very hard to get back in again. So that social interaction and, you know, um, for all of us, we all know people who live in their own or nearby, but actually just calling in on them and making sure that they are aware of, of social outlets for themselves because that is that is so important, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, we've spoken about it before and I spoke to John Nolan about this. There's obviously a link between um, um, macular degeneration and um, Alzheimer's, isn't there? The, the conditions are associated and actually we have an understanding now of a common um, mechanism or one of the many mechanisms in terms of oxidative damage to the eye, back of the eye and to the, to the brain as well. Mm -hmm. And the work on macular degeneration has indicated that um, supplementation with carotenoid uh, antioxidant compounds um, can be beneficial and can perhaps slow the progression of the disease. And that raises interesting questions about um, how early on in the process you can actually apply these so for example my understanding is that for macular degeneration nobody has as yet done a very large scale trial on very very early situations of people at high risk for example with this positive family history uh, and shown an intervention does actually make a difference that's a very big long-term scale trial. nobody's tackling it now what about dementia though because we're it's interesting there that there's clearly a role for protective compounds and yet actually doing experimental work will be very difficult. Um, 
what you, you said in the last time, last conversation we had that you do tell people about the evidence we've got so far, but you also said yes, we would like to do a much larger scale trial and got to get a interest in other countries as well. And ultimately, of course, we've got to get guidance into um, uh, clinical guidelines and public health guidelines. Um, so I suppose a good point to consider would be where are you now in relation to what you're doing in for dementia in the Republic of Ireland and where would you like to see it go over the next five to ten years? What changes would you like to see occur apart from doing this huge trial that we can do and we can find the five million pounds to pay, pay for it? What would you like to see happen over the next five to ten years? So, uh, you know, and and the, the first answer is I would like everyone to, to think of primary prevention ahead of getting Alzheimer's disease at all. However, if you do have Alzheimer's disease or early Alzheimer's disease, I think early diagnosis is really important um, and diagnosis is made obviously with, with history and there is various imaging tests and psychological tests and um, lumbar punctures that you can do to get an early diagnosis. Why is that a benefit? It's a benefit because you know, all of, of these things that we're talking about. So carotenoids, which is the compound we're talking about, you know, the reason why we're interested in them is that they're very potent anti-inflammatories and antioxidants and degeneration of cells as in macular degeneration or in Alzheimer's disease, which is degeneration of brain cells. It all really starts with this inflammation and increased um, oxidative stress. And then ultimately you have these amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles laid down the brain. But we know that carotenoids have potent activity that should reduce your inflammation and your antioxidant stress. So there's a very good reason for doing that. What would I like to see with, with Alzheimer's disease? I'd really like to see um, the global health programme that we're talking about, you know, that I think the new drugs are, are just fantastic, but they are really going to be very expensive and for quite a small subset of people. And what we need in addition to that, because they have a really valuable role and I'm very excited to see them coming through. But what we really need is we need to look at the health. What advice are we going to give everybody sitting in front of us? And the advice for everybody is diet and exercise, remembering that with the devolution of foodstuffs, that sometimes getting the dietary levels of things that we need, really you can't, it's very challenging and therefore there are supplements out there. And why, do, why am I saying about Remind specifically? I use Remind because there, that's the exact formulation that we used in the clinical trial. So there are lots of formulations out there. There are lots of um, health food shops selling formulations. And to be honest, I don't really know what's in those but I, I specifically know what's in the Remind formulation. And then it's the whole, you know, it's the whole better society, better approach to looking after people, which includes all of the things that you've just said there, you know, just remembering the importance of socialization, the importance of routine, the importance of keeping people living well, because, you know, one of our major advances and successes in medicine is getting people to live longer but people would like to live longer and well and really taking this this sort of global approach is so important to doing that because remember all of these things i'm talking about hypertension smoking diet exercise also has a very positive impact on many other diseases not just alzheimer's disease so you know is there a downside to being um, paying a lot of attention to your health across the spectrum of things. No, it's 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 good for your whole your whole condition really. As a geriatrician, almost everything I deal with is almost everything we all deal with is to do with degeneration of cells. And all of these approaches that I'm talking about um, should reduce the degeneration of cells, ultimately um, leading to a lot less diseases across the spectrum. Yeah. Um. Another uh, issue is the um, health economics um, considerations in relation to all of these things. And of course, social care can be extraordinarily expensive. Uh, and therefore, uh, bearing in mind the limitations on um, health care budgets, it would be very good to try to keep people as uh, active and uh, independent for as long as possible, which is why, you know, it'd be good if everybody did their physical exercises and didn't fall over and so on. Um, and we do have, I mean, in, in NHS England, for example, we do have a falls prevention program, uh, which tries to identify people who are at risk of falls, those sorts of things. And I, I guess you've probably got exactly the same in 
the Republic of Ireland. Um, but at a recent meeting in London, at which you were present and John Nolan was present, there was a little bit of discussion about the health economics of, for example, supplementation. Now, I do recognise that we've got to get to the stage of having a very large scale multinational trial before we can move to actually advocating this. But in terms of the actual costs of comparing the costs of progressing more rapidly to re requiring more care in relation to dementia compared to supplementation. And the difficult question, of course, is at what point do you need to start supplementing? You know, at what age, you know, 10 years, 20 years before symptoms begin? It's a difficult one. Nobody knows the answer to that, I guess. Um, how economically viable is it to, to suggest that people should give themselves a supplement on a regular basis for years and years and years and years, which is what will happen? And of course, we should say this is beneficial to sight, shouldn't we? Because there will be perhaps a reduced risk of moving forward to macular degeneration, but actually sight itself can be improved even if you've got normal sight. And some of the experimental evidence shows that. So there's lots. this has lots of implications. And there's your paper that you published recently on um, uh, inflammatory markers in relation to these supplements. So it sort of spreads across a whole series of different systems, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Degenerative disease. Absolutely. You know, I suppose if we take the NHS, so in the UK, currently there's about a million people or so with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And the cost to the NHS is probably about 45 billion. And um, it's just extraordinary. But the more advanced your disease becomes, the more expensive it is. And actually, the expense is really mainly borne out by family and family members. So for every person with Alzheimer's disease, there's three or four family members that are directly affected. And about 9% of the cost really is to do with, you know, healthcare costs and diagnosis, etc. So, you know, the, the, it's very hard to do the economics of, of you know, uh, food supplementation because, and the reason it's very hard is exactly as you've just said there, you know, wh when do you start, how long do you keep going for? Just really importantly, though, that if you can delay going from, you know, early onset Alzheimer's disease or mild Alzheimer's disease to moderate Alzheimer's disease, to severe Alzheimer's disease, if you can delay that journey, then you have huge significant savings. You know, the cost per person with severe Alzheimer's disease to the NHS in healthcare economics is probably about 100,000 per year. So if we are paying close attention to our dietary intake um, and our exercise and all those other things, and we can delay that that period of time by one to two years, that the 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 savings would be just extraordinary. And to address the question that I can't address, uh, you know, when do you start? You know, the, the, the bottom line is, um, you know, our our intake of, of good nutrition, particularly in the Western world, but really all over the place now, has been very challenging. And I think, you know, when is too early? It's probably never too early, but we need, we need the research to back that statement up. Yeah, yeah. good. So I think that uh, what, what we've actually covered is a, a lot of in, interesting uh, information. And I should point out to people who are watching that underneath the window which contains this video, there is some text and then a series of web links to sites in the different countries around the world relating to the Alzheimer's Society. And then particular ones that I've picked out, as I mentioned earlier, the ones from uh, the Alzheimer's Society for Canada, which has some extremely useful um, text uh, actually there. So I do recommend that people look at those. Um, so Rira uh, Marca in Waterford, thank you very much indeed for talking to me. Um, no doubt in a few years time we maybe have another conversation when we've got some more experimental information and I'll look out for that five million pounds so that you and John Nolan can, uh, can do the multi, multi centre trial at some point in the future. So thank you very much indeed for talking to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.